All right, well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for March 15th, 2012. This week, we're going to update you on the uh, SpaceX missions, uh, a ambitious plan to nuke asteroids and the uh, potential downsides, and some uh, strange Russian artifacts on Mars. So, uh, so first, let's let's just go with Alan. And so, Alan, you got a big update on uh, on SpaceX. Well, maybe not that big, but uh, SpaceX is moving ahead. They're going to, uh, as people who have been following in the snow, that now that the space shuttle fleet has been retired, uh, the U.S. doesn't have any way to get things back and forth. And so, uh, NASA is putting a lot of stock in commercialization to try to get first supplies and eventually astronauts back and forth. And so the SpaceX flight has been looked forward to eagerly for months because uh, it would be the first commercial flight to the International Space Station. It's actually a demonstration flight to uh, show that their system for cargo transport is going to work. And if it does work, then they're in line for uh, more than a billion dollars in contracts from, from NASA. And so uh, they set a date, uh, April 30th, for that first flight. It was going to go in February, and then they decided that they had some things they needed to do, to, uh, in, including uh, painting the uh, spacecraft so that it uh, was able to keep at the right temperature in space. And so uh, they're finally uh, thinking that they can have everything done for April 30th and then dock with the International Space Station in, in May. So chances are there it's not going to happen quite on April 30th because uh, that's sort of the way things go with the commercial space uh, effort. And uh, some people say, when I mentioned that uh, in my Facebook page, uh, some people said, well, uh, you're really downplaying uh, the commercial space uh, because this happens in traditional space efforts as well. But uh, I think for commercial space uh, providers, that's not such a big deal to try to uh, get everything right and uh, to do it when, uh, to do a launch when uh, everything looks right. If there's something that looks out of place, uh, you know, let's uh, stop the countdown. Let's start it again maybe in a half hour. Let's start it again in a couple of days. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's good that they have a date that people can be working toward and looking forward toward. And uh, if everything goes the way we expect in April, maybe in early May, uh, we'll really be making some history with the commercial space effort. So that's the story. Right. And, and you know what? I completely forgot to introduce everybody. I cannot believe I did that. So I have a question for you. But, but at first, I've got to mention that you are Alan yeah. Boyle from MSNBC's Cosmic Log. So, uh, um, and Emily Lockdewalla from the Planetary Society, and uh, and Ian O'Neill from Discovery Space. So, uh, oh, anyway, I'm so excited to hear about SpaceX. So, but we were at, we're at um, there was another round of news this week that it's SpaceX's tenth anniversary. Tenth anniversary, right? yeah. So, it's weird because it's you know we talk about space as this fled SpaceX is this fledgling uh, group that's you know slowly working towards the next steps of its prototypes and so on. But really, this company's been around for 10 years, has been developing technology, making tests. I mean, it's a old company now. Yeah. And like every uh, company uh, in the space business, they probably expected that they would be further along by the time the 10th anniversary rolled around. Uh, if you look at how many flights have actually taken place, it's uh, not all that many, something like uh, six or so. And so uh, I think uh, Elon Musk has said on more than one occasion that he, he's realized that uh, rocket science is frickin' hard. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that may be a direct quote, but uh, I, I think that uh, the fact that they're a profitable company, that they're gaining contracts, in fact, they announced two satellite contracts just this week, uh, shows that uh, you can make a go of this, uh, and really, SpaceX is just getting started. 
and there are other people in the in the hunt as well, uh, ranging from traditional players like Boeing that's getting into commercial space, as well as Blue Origin in my neck of the woods, uh, the company that's being backed by um, Amazon.com billionaire Jeff Bezos. And so we're it's not just going to be about SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX might be the first to really get to this milestone, but uh, there are a lot of other companies, and so it, it doesn't rely just on the fortunes of one company. Yeah, but we're really at the point where you know, it, th that first 10 years are always the hardest when you start a company. And if you can survive yeah. that 10 years, then, then the momentum really starts to happen. And you can imagine over the next 10 years, all of the dominoes are going to fall. And a lot of these, con I mean, they're so well positioned. A lot of these contracts for launch are going to, if they can pull this off, are going to start to move to them. They're going to be launching astronauts to the space station. They're going to be lifting cargo. And I'm sure a lot of people who are looking at, at their putting their satellites on these whatever $5,000 per pound missions are going to have a good long look at what SpaceX is doing and start to shift uh, missions over there. So this is now we're into the momentum phase of this business and I think finally right. Elon Musk is going to get a chance to have a good night's sleep. <laughs> if you if you if if you want to watch a really interesting um, DVD, there's the Who Killed the Electric Car, and then there's this newer one like the Revenge of the Electric Car, and in that there's a really some really great interviews of Elon Musk, and you can just see trying to run Tesla and SpaceX at the same time was killing him, and uh, and so I think now he's he's starting to recover a little bit. So, um, so Ian, uh, you've got an interesting story. Uh, about nuking asteroids. That that is not a bad idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a hard question because that's the assumed thing. It's like you know, you got an asteroid coming at you, you're gonna throw your entire nuclear deterrent into space. I mean, that's that's a given. Um, so scientists actually decided to put some science behind this, and most recently, it wasn't really news news because actually this video was released back in. Oh, back in January, I think. Um, but it comes from the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. And of course, they're quite well known with their nuclear deterrents and working on research of that ilk. And these guys, they um, did a, uh, a 3D simulation of a asteroid getting blown up by a nuclear weapon. Um, now, there's real science that goes into this, and they actually used uh, one of their big supercomputers that had, like, uh, well, I'm sure, Fraser, you'd be excited to hear that they, they used, like, 32,000 processors in this particular uh, supercomputer. Uh, uh, CDO, I think it is, CDO uh, supercomputer. It's, like, the 10th fastest computer in the world or something. And um, they found that the shockwave from a one megaton weapon uh, could disrupt a 500 meter wide asteroid enough to deflect it from um, from a from an Earth encounter. Now, when they say deflect, I don't know whether they mean it's going to be completely blown to smithereens. I don't think that's the case. They're actually looking at hitting the surface of this asteroid, and the shock wave will propagate in such a way that it will um, impart as much momentum on that on that asteroid to push it out of the way. Obviously, it's going to be pretty damaged along the way, but you know, at least it's at least it's sorted out. Now, I think a one megaton weapon is probably about 50 times the size of Hiroshima bomb. So, they, you know, it's, it's a very it's certainly within our scope to be able to launch such a weapon. I mean, whether it would be feasible politically um, is another um, another thing. But th this is like a, the latest in a whole range of research into whether it's worth firing nuclear weapons in space because there's the argument that you know we may woefully underestimate the size of the weapon we need or we may not understand the structure of an asteroid uh, well enough to be able to hit it with an asteroid with a with a uh, with a nuclear weapon so and then there's also sort of quite a fun piece of research that if you hit <laughs> hit an asteroid with a nuclear weapon too far out, what will happen? It'll explode, and then under mutual gravity, it'll reform. So you've got a transforming asteroid that will come down and get you. And also, there's the point that if you fire it too late, if you fire the nuclear missile at the at the asteroid, it'll break apart into many small pieces. So it's almost like being the choice between getting hit by a bullet or buckshot. So basically, like being shot at by a uh, by a, a cosmic uh, shotgun. So, I mean, it's, it's a very unsavory discussion. And, of course, this, uh, this ignites a lot of 
science fiction fantasies like uh, Armageddon with uh, Bruce Willis sending his team of oil drillers to, a, to an asteroid, which, as this new research shows, you don't need Bruce Willis. You can just fire a missile at the surface. You don't have to bore into it. Um, I, I just think that now we're putting some science behind it, and it's a very serious issue. And, of course, you know when you start talking about nuking asteroids, it's a, it's a fun thing to write about and fun thing to read. But actually, that is a very serious um, uh, point in our uh, asteroid um, collision mitigation. So it, it is taken, being taken seriously, and I, th I quite like that. And I quite like this research because there's some funky 3D images of an asteroid getting blown up. So who doesn't like that? But I mean, I mean, is the issue really blowing up an asteroid, or is it just about imparting enough of a kick to its trajectory that 20 years down the road, it's not going to impact the Earth? I mean, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now this is this is the one thing that's kind of scary because the one thing NASA will say, oh, it's okay. We've we found like the majority of near Earth asteroids that can wipe out all life on the planet. I'm not really concerned about this, and I think and Phil Plate has discussed this many times. It's it's the guy, it's the it's the it's the asteroids that can take out a city or a continent that we're probably more concerned about because they're they're far more. Um, they're more, they, they hit the Earth at more regularity than these extinction-level events, but they're also very, they're a lot harder to, um, to see because they're smaller. I mean, that's basically what it is. And so, um, I mean, only recently, I think it was last week, um, I was away in the UK, so I was on vacation, so I kind of missed all the, the buzz about this, but I think Alan wrote about this. Um, a, an asteroid which is, what, 150 meters wide has been discovered, and it's going to make a, um, a very near miss uh, this time next year, in 2013. And it's a 150 meter wide piece of rock, so that thing could take out a city if it hit us. And it's actually going to fly underneath the orbit of geosynchronous satellites. So this is a very close call. It's no chance it's going to hit us. But the point is, say if we discovered a like object that was actually on target, we'd only have a year to do something about it. Last time I realized, last time I looked, we don't actually have an in-space infrastructure to deal with any kind of space threat, let alone an asteroid that's bearing down on us a year in advance. So that's the kind of scary thing, and that's the kind of thing this research is useful for, because if you gathered the world's governments and threw a lot of money into an anti-asteroid um, anti, uh, missile that could perhaps hit it a few months in advance, and if it was decided to be a good idea that's where this kind of research would really come into play, I think. So smaller objects are probably more scary than the extinction-level events because at the moment I think there's no chance of a, an extinction-level event hitting us for at least a few hundred years. Um, smaller ones, we just don't know. Yeah, I mean, if, if a Tunguska-sized object hit Paris or London yeah. <clears throat> or New York City, I mean, the damage would be catastrophic. So, and or that say was Fukushima, which would be roughly the same scale of the 50-meter um, asteroid hitting, would be the same scale of disaster as happened in Japan recently. Yeah, yeah, and those, it's almost impossible to track them all down and to know where they all are, and, and many, you're just not going to catch them until the last minute. So that's, uh, yeah, it's really interesting research. But and it's really funny. There's a couple of good pieces of, of news to take away from, you know, discovering these things close to us, and that's the fact that we can discover them at all. Um, it's only pretty recently that we've been able to do that because you need um, more sensitive detectors that um, can reload faster so you can catch them moving very close to you. And when we first started imagining human missions to asteroids, one of the problems is that uh, there aren't currently any really good targets to send humans to, but the more of these things that we discover, the better um, targets we'll find to actually be able to plan a future human mission to one. Um, the other thing regarding the risk is that while it's more likely for a 50 meter thing to hit us than it is for a one kilometer, if you're an insurance agent, what you want to look at is the aggregate risk to um, you know, any given individual from these things. And, and a 50 meter one um, has about a one and a half million chance of ruining your life, you specifically that I'm talking to right now. Whereas the one kilometer one, because it's effects aren't just local to the city, like, say, Fukushima, they're global, you personally have a 1 in 40,000 chance of being affected by one of these global level ones. So we need to be equally concerned, even more concerned about those. Obviously, the smaller ones are more preventable um, and are likely to be more frequent. So it's, it's a, um, a lower risk, but a higher, li higher likelihood of those smaller impacts. You just have to balance it all out. But it seems really weird to say it, but it sounds like all of the, <coughs> excuse me, um, all of the technical issues have, have been worked out. At this point, NASA has plenty of experience uh, delivering payloads to asteroids. 
So, the, I mean, the rocket infrastructure exists and is known, uh, and the military has plenty of experience in creating nuclear weapons and detonating them and having them, you know, and simulating them and knowing what they're going to do. So, so, and there's the maintenance infrastructure and all that. So it almost seems like now is the time to to take a rocket, put a big nuclear bomb on the top of it, and put it on a launch pad somewhere and maintain it for this eventual necessity. It's just like, I mean, obviously there's going to be all kinds of political ramifications for having a big nuclear bomb ready to go, but that already exists in the world. So, you know, having, having one of those 10,000 ICBMs pointed into space as opposed to somewhere else on Earth would be, I think, a wise thing to do. But can you imagine <laughs> the U.S. says, I'm going to build a really big nuclear weapon to take out an asteroid? <laughs> they would, they would, right, they who, who knows? Maybe they do. Yeah, yeah, they just aren't talking about it. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that there, you know, this is one part of the research. But there has to be a lot more research done into what the structure of asteroids are. And, and in the past, some people have said that if you uh, if you don't do it correctly, you'll just have a whole lot of hail coming down at you, uh, capable of taking out uh, cities, each one. But it's, it's, a, it's a good start to try to model how to deal with these things when that time comes. And it, it is a question of when rather than if. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually, NASA never has landed on an asteroid with a spacecraft that was designed to do that, although they did manage to take near all the way down to one um, and, and touch down at the very end of that mission. Um, they're going to do that with OSIRIS-REx in a few years. It's going to be visiting a 600-meter diameter asteroid, which is a little bit bigger than Itokawa, which is the one that Hayabusa visited. But both of these things are much larger than the 50 meter, 100 meter things that we're talking about being scared about. And those may be fundamentally different creatures from um, the five, even the 500 and 600 meter scale things. So we, we don't actually have all the experience that we would like to have. Although I, I do agree with you, Fraser, that we actually have probably, m we, we are at a state of technical readiness where we could talk about preparing such a mission. I guess I do yeah. that way. Well, maybe they should just, you know, bolt a one megaton bomb onto the side of the Osiris Rex mission. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and then just when they're done, kaboom. Uh -huh. Go with a bang, press the self-destruct button. But it, but it all comes down to politics. I mean, that's the main thing. I mean, technology, yeah. we, can, we can overcome any technological issue, really. I mean, um, but it just assumes infinite funding to do it. And <laughs> I think that's, sure, that's but, really the key thing. But I guess, my, you know, the politics for sure, but if you have a one megaton bomb sitting on top of the equivalent of a Saturn V rocket, that has only one purpose, which is to go to space. You might want to nuke Mars or something, you know. And so these bombs already exist on top of rockets that are only designed to point at Earth. You know, a, an ICBM cannot make, cannot hit escape velocity with that kind of a payload. So it's going to land on Earth. But if you have a bigger rocket, a big Delta or a Titan with a, with a bomb on top, then, then I think that's safer. That's, you know, that's pointed at the moon or Mars. My, or, you know. my question here is whether a warhead is actually necessary. Because if you think about the kinetic energy of a um, you know, reasonably massive satellite being plowed into an asteroid at the kinds of encounter speeds that you're talking about, you're talking about many kilometers per second, whether having a warhead on it actually makes any difference whatsoever to the amount of energy you're putting into the asteroid. And I remember um, with the Deep Impact, you know, that mission, there was a lot of discussion how we are not bombing a comet. It. There is absolutely nothing explosive about it. It's nothing but a couple hundred kilogram mass of copper that is just kinetically, it's a bullet, it's not a bomb. And I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious, Ian, if, they, if there's any discussion about whether there was, a warhead was even necessary for this purpose. Yeah, I think it comes down to, with, with this particular um, um, study, it was purely about a nuclear weapon going off. Um, but I think the key thing that they want to look at was that provides an instant release of energy. I mean, if you fired, you know, uh, a couple of hundred or even, say, say a ton uh, kinetic impactor into an asteroid of that size, it may adjust the, it may impart enough momentum into that body uh, to slightly nudge it off target, perhaps if you had 20 years lead time. Um, but with a nuclear weapon, and also you've got to remember about the composition of these asteroids. As we found when Hayabusa, um, you know, the touch base with uh, Itsukawa in, uh, in 2005, that's the Japanese sample return mission actually turned out to be very successful even though it was a complete failure in many ways. Um, 
And they, they, they managed to realize that Itakawa was a rubble pile. It was basically just a very loose collection of other rocks all sticking together. It's almost like a proto-planet. It's like the, the, the seed of a planet where all these objects are kind of all sticking together under mutual gravity. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, then you start forming planetary objects and they start becoming circular. Um, but these asteroids are basically the wasted seeds of or just the debris left over from the development of the solar system. So they are so far that we know, I mean, obviously there's a lot of variety in, in asteroids, but we, that's a big mystery in itself. But the Itakawa type asteroid, which is the one that was being looked at, kind of the, a similar one that's being looked at in this 3D simulation, is actually a loose collection of rubble. And if you imagine, if you hit that with a, if, say if you had a sandbag and you hit that with a bullet, it would pretty much absorb most of the energy from that bullet. I wouldn't necessarily think that it would impart that much momentum to push it out of the way. It would absorb a lot of that energy because there's a lot of loose moving rocks. Um, whereas if it was a solid object, I think you know a kinetic impact would work quite well because the momentum will be transferred to actually moving that body out of the way. Um, so by using a nuclear weapon, they're actually blowing it up on the surface and they're watching this shockwave propagate all the way through the rock all the, all the individual pieces of rock in this loose rubble pile. So you're kind of getting more bang for your buck. So you're not just hitting a kinetic impactor into it and it's getting absorbed. You're actually generating this shock wave that will pass through the body and it will affect every single rock within that rubble pile and ultimately push out of the way. And if you can impart enough energy, it'll actually blow it apart. Um, I think this one megaton um, uh, weapon is like the minimum for like a uh, 500 meter wide rock, was it? I think it was 500 meters wide. So you'd need something a lot bigger for a bigger rubble pile. <laughs> right. The bigger the better. But then again, I mean, I think it's, there's a lot of unknowns. I think that's really the key thing with this. But yeah, so still is interesting, just the discussion about the uh, the composition of these asteroids. We don't know a lot n enough about them. We need to send more missions to more asteroids. You can't get enough information about these things. And as Emily said, it's we don't know anything, next to nothing about these smaller objects that could really spell a bad day for Sydney or, or New York. So we just need to do more work. More Thanks. work. Yeah. All right, well, Emily, why don't we wrap up with, uh, with your story about uh, Russian artifacts on Mars? Russian artifacts on the moon. Around on the moon, yeah. That's what, yeah, yeah, so um, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been uh, in orbit at the moon for a while, and, and like Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, it's got a camera that's high resolution enough to actually pick up human artifacts on the surface of the moon. And most of the time, we've been getting excited about seeing Apollo artifacts and the tracks of the astronauts. But something I, I'm always tickled by seeing the, the Russian spacecraft on the moon, particularly Lunokhod. So Lunokhod is a eight-wheeled rover that was sent to the moon. There's actually two of them. Um, they were sent to the moon in 1973. And it was sort of like, you know, any, um, it, kind of like the MER mission in that there is a lander that encased the rover and then it deployed ramps and the rover rolled off the ramps. The main difference is that because it was on the moon and not Mars, the controllers could actually joystick the rovers driving around the moon so that you didn't need this aut autonomous intelligence like uh, the Mars Exploration rovers have, which is why it was possible to do it in 1973. Um, there are several different challenges about being on the moon, like, for instance, the fact that the days are two weeks long and then the nights are two weeks long. So I think the nominal mission was only supposed to be a few days, and, and they managed to actually keep the rovers alive through a couple of lunar, several lunar nights, so in other words, several months. They call these lunations on their website where you can download a whole lot of really cool panoramic images. But let me share my screen and show you some of these cool pictures. So here is... Um, the actual rover, and as you can see down here, it's, um, it's, it's washed out. The thing is so bright, it's so reflective that um, it's saturated the camera detector. But you can actually see the tracks that the rover made. You can see a little donut here where it turned in place. It turned much like the Spirit and Opportunity do, just by rotating in place. Um, and then here is a, is a different selection from the same uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter image. This is the lander, Luna 16. Uh, so Luna, uh, Luna 16. And again, you can see right here where the rover drove off the lander. It went away. It was deploying several um, sensors, I think. Um, it came back, did several donuts next to the lander, spun around, took photos of it, and then it drove off. And um, I forget, the, I couldn't find quickly the distance that Lunacode 1 traveled, but Lunacode 2 went 37 kilometers. 
Um, and I checked, and that's actually just slightly more than the Apollo 17 astronauts drove in their lunar buggy. So they still have the lunar distance record. It did take them a lot longer to get that distance. It's also about four kilometers longer than Opportunity has driven on Mars. So the Russians and Lunahood still hold the distance record for driving across the surface of a planet other than Earth, which is really pretty astonishing. So I always, I always love to see these vehicles. They're one of my favorite things about Russian space exploration history. I really, you know, and again, this really just makes you laugh at the people who think that the lunar missions were faked. At this point, the amount of, of images that are just coming back showing each of the missions, their footprints on the moon, all of the hardware, the, you know, matching exactly the kinds of missions that they did, it's just astonishing. I mean, it's so great to have this spacecraft that had, that had gathered all these images, yeah. And one of the well, they're all in on the conspiracy. conspiracy yeah. Yeah. Even <laughs> yeah. the Russians are in on the conspiracy. I like right. That. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one, of the, one of the nice things about Lunar Reconnaissance Orbit or spotting the Luna Hoods is that they carried corner reflectors just like the Apollo missions did, but we didn't know the positions of the Luna Hood landing sites well enough to find um, one of these corner reflectors, so, um, so we couldn't do, you know, we do experiments from Earth where we fire lasers at the corner reflectors on the moon and, and we time how long it takes them to come back and you can measure very, very sensitively the distance between Earth and moon and how that varies with time and that can tell you about the uh, moon's internal geologic structure and other stuff like that. So we have several of these where the Apollo missions landed, but they're all clustered in one specific spot on the lunar near side, or at least in a pretty tight region. And the lunar hood ones are a little bit more distant um, toward the, the uh, edges of the lunar disk. So one of them we knew where it was, but the other one we didn't until Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter finally spotted it last year, and they were successfully able to fire a laser and range off the lunar code corner reflector. So that was really a um, a pretty cool achievement of both Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Code mission so many years la later after it landed. That's one of my best arguments that I give to people when they're not sure that we landed on the moon. As I say that there are these retro reflectors that are on the surface of the moon. You can point a laser exactly at the landing sites and you can, you can get a bounce back of your laser which is bouncing off these reflectors, but you can't do it at other spots. So that's just evidence that, that those reflectors are there. And again, you can watch a video of the astronauts putting this stuff down. So anyway, I, I, I think we don't need to explain it anymore. They, <clears throat> if you're watching this, you, you, uh, you, you agree with us. So um, Now, you had some other pictures, though, of a trip you just went to, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if Alan wants to... Um, yeah, Alan, you've got a role, right? Oh, yeah. So, so thanks so much, and great to see you all, and uh, see you next week. All right. See you later, Alan. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Alan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yesterday the, uh, an invitation went out to the press a couple days ago to visit um, a, small, uh, a small business named Honeybee Robotics. They're actually based in New York, but they have offices in Longmont, Colorado and in Pasadena um, because NASA's chief technology officer was sort of on a state visit to them, being shown um, the kinds of stuff that they were doing. And, and I knew Honeybee because they produced the rock abrasion tool on the Mars Exploration Rover. So that's the little tool. I actually have a picture of that one. So once again, I'm going to share my screen. Right. That's that grinder that was on the end of the arm on the, uh, on the, the rovers that would scrape away a little bit of rock so that they could then analyze the, uh, the surface, the geology of the rock underneath. That's right. So here's a picture of that, um, looking up into the business end of it. So here, uh, this is where the drill is, and there's this tiny little thing here is the bit, and there's a brush attached to it as well. Um, this particular rock abrasion tool is um, it's flight hardware. It's 90% of what you see here. There's, here's the tool, and here's the robotic arm. Is, um, is the same hardware that has been sent to Mars. It was all developed as part of the same process. So that was pretty cool to look at, uh, including the little shield here that sits over the rock abrasion tool. It has an American flag on it. It's hard to see from this angle, um, but that's actually made with steel from the World Trade Center. Um, so it was cool to visit the rock abrasion tool, but it was even cooler to see some of the new stuff that they're doing there. Um, one thing here, this is a photo of the vice president of Honeybee with what looks like a vacuum cleaner. Um, and what it actually is, is a pneumatic uh, sample delivery system such that, uh, I don't know if you guys remember with the Phoenix mission, how, uh, how uh, much of a problem they had trying to get dirt into their um, instruments in order to, to perform chemical analysis on it because they had, they had this scoop um, 
and they, they would scoop and they'd lift up soil, but the position wasn't all that accurate, so they were dumping soil all over the, the sieves and, and they found out the soil was clumpy and it couldn't get through the sieves in order to get to the instrument. But instead of that, um, Honeybee is suggesting that you use um, nothing more than a tube and compressed gas. Um, spacecraft already carry compressed gas with them. They carry helium and nitrogen in order to pressurize their reaction control systems. And usually landers just vent that to, to vacuum as soon as they land. So they would make use of it, use little puffs of gas to deliver um, little soil samples through tubes directly into instruments without, you don't need any actuators. You don't, there's no moving parts involved. There's no trying to get stuff inside a tiny little port. Just and it's in there. Um, and this was, they use it in so many different systems. They actually also have commercial applications for it in uh, sample, um, sampling through boreholes in, for the mining industry so that they can figure out um, the chemical composition as they drill down into rocks. So that was pretty cool. And then um, one of the last very cool things was, uh, here's the, the president of Honeybee, um, uh, Keel Davis holding, it's a 8U uh, a satellite bus that's being developed by a different company to make very small satellites for Earth orbit purposes. Um, and what he's showing off inside it are four little black boxes, and I have a close-up of that. And what these things are is they are, they're basically um, reaction control gyros that are used for pointing the spacecraft. And they're of a similar design that's actually used for uh, rotating and pointing the solar panels on the, on the space station. So they're a similar object. Um, on the space station, of course, they're the size of a, a forklift. I mean, they're, they're very big. But here, they're, they're small enough to fit them inside an 8U CubeSat, and unfortunately not a, not a 1U CubeSat. So this is 20 centimeters across here. Um, but with these guys, you can ha achieve really high rates of angular motion um, in order to point very precisely at all kinds of targets. For, so it's, it's good for photography. It's also good for maneuvering a spacecraft very close to an asteroid, which is an application that we discussed. With a um, bomb on it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no bombs. <laughs> um, but but anyway, it was it was all very exciting. You know, one of the other things that's great about small satellites is that small satellites are cheaper to launch. So um, that puts satellites into the into the reach of smaller and smaller companies and countries, um, and even students. So uh, all of the stuff that we saw there, it was it was really fascinating. And and it's kind of amazing. It's a, it's a relatively small company, only 50 employees. And, and yet they're producing this um, you know, great technology that's going to make space exploration cheaper and, and more, uh, less risky and more successful in the future. That's really great. I would love one of those little satellites. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for no scientific purpose at all, just, you know, just a, a camera pointing up to space. Um, so, all right, so why don't we get some, some quick questions answered, and um, let's see... Uh, So I guess George Roy says, uh, why don't we attach science packages and tracking pa packages to the asteroids as they pass? Um, perhaps having mobile radar out there on a few asteroids would be handy for further detection, maybe. Um, so, so, I mean, what do you think about, the, about how good of an idea it would be to get some, some scientific packages sitting on the surface of these asteroids? The Planetary Society has actually run a design competition to, um, to get uh, small companies, even students, proposing a mission to do exactly that, to tag an asteroid. And the reason you would do it would be if you were not exactly sure if an asteroid um, poses a threat to you or not, if it could be an impactor, but it might not be. Much better than designing an expensive mission with a warhead on it to blow it up is to first just tag it, track it very precisely, That'll let you, with, the, with a tagging device on the surface that you can track using a, radi a radio system, you will be able to determine much more certainly whether the thing is going to impact Earth or not. It's a much cheaper way to reduce the risk of its impact than blowing it up. Um, so tagging an asteroid is a very good idea if you think the asteroid may pose a risk to Earth in the future. Yeah, and I think the Russians, they were discussing an idea. They wanted to tag um, Apophis, didn't they, at one point? Yeah, well, we'd, rather do this with <laughs> we'd rather do this with one that doesn't actually pose a threat to Earth at first before yeah. we go, go into yeah, the Yeah, but they were on about, you know, that uh, the Russians, they wanted to, to, you know, to drop a, um, like a micro-satellite and it's going to attach itself to the, to the surface of Apophis and you'd um, travel with it through the solar system to see how, um, you know, the, the, so, the solar wind will affect it for a start. You know, the solar radiation, solar wind and there's certain effects on asteroids and it depends on their color, it depends on their, their composition as well. They can spin up, they can actually be nudged slightly out of the way. In fact, that's one of the mitigation 
collision mitigation plans, you could actually paint an asteroid, you know, fire blobs of paint on it, and change the change the color of the surface because then that would change the way it reacts to sunlight. So there's there's certain experiments you could do on on an asteroid, and as Amy said, you, know, you could find a benign asteroid and just put a um, a little scientific package on there, and you can see how how it spins and how it changes during its orbit. I mean, it'd be a, if you could find you know like an Earth asteroid that that you could attach one of these things to and see it go through the solar system and see how the planets affect its orbital trajectory, I think that'd be fascinating. That'd It'd be, be an 2012. awesome mission. 2012 DA14 would be a perfect asteroid to do that yeah, with, because you know it's, it's the right size to be worried about. It's not actually going to hit us, um, and it would, and it's going to pass very close to us. So it would be very easy to to fire something at it and get something to land on it. It wouldn't be very expensive. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of of missions to asteroids for all of these reasons that that they tell us a tremendous amount about the formation of the solar system. They have resources on it. People said like just one asteroid might have more you know, have trillions of dollars worth of gold locked in them. And <clears throat> and there's an issue of our safety that these things are, are at one point, as Phil always says, you know, it's not a question of if, it's just a matter of when one of these things is going to hit us and ruin, you know, ruin our day. So so I think that there's lots of really good reasons. I, I'm I'm surprised that NASA hasn't put more emphasis on to into asteroid exploration and, and even like really set them as a, as a target for human space exploration. They get like 99% of the way there and then they pull back and, and aim at the moon again. And they're like, yeah, we're going to send humans to an asteroid and then they say, oh, we're back to the moon. We're off to Mars. But it's, it's like the Hayabusa mission. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just love this mission. I mean, I discussed it two weeks ago, but it just, the, just the fact that they were able to collect like a few thousand specks, you know, microscopic specks of asteroid dust, and they were able to bring it back to the Earth. Um, it was perfectly yeah. preserved, and they were able to look, and they, were able to, they, they actually were surprised that these microscopic specks have in fact got impacts from m nano um, nano tiny uh, meteorites. So basically, the, it does basically suggest that there's a, a lot of these micrometeorites in space, and they're, they're impacting the very the smallest structures in the solar system. Basically, these these rocks that make up you know planetary seeds. So you're actually seeing the very very tiny processes that go into building entire planets, and that's just from a mission that went horribly wrong, <laughs> and they are able to vacuum up a very little sample and bring it back to Earth, and. That, that was done on a fairly low budget as well. So, you know, it's not impossible that these things can be done. It's just, you know, backing of money. And, of course, NASA in, in really in a situation to come up with any big grand ideas. But putting a, a, a tracker onto an asteroid just doesn't seem like a, that big of a deal. I mean, one, one problem is that NASA doesn't really have a program for technology development spacecraft right now. Um, so you, you've got science missions and you've got um, the human exploration beast that it's, it's not really NASA that's the problem, it's Congress that's the problem. Um, but, but you, we, you know, we've only had, like, there was Deep Space One, which was a technology demonstration mission of ion engines, and then there was um, Clementine, which was actually a Department of Defense mission that was supposed to uh, rendezvous with an asteroid. That part of the mission failed, but on its way to an asteroid, it, it actually orbited the moon for a little while and got some of the best lunar maps we had until right. LRO got there. Um, but that was a DOD mission, not a NASA mission. And I think that um, the only way to really get these missions to happen is if the Department of Defense thinks that it's a good idea to attempt to defend ourselves against an asteroid, because those are the people actually that we, that we really want thinking. I don't really want science people running a mission to save Earth from, you know, it, it, it really is a defense problem, and you want scientists involved. You, you have to have scientists, you know, advising such a mission, um, being the ones trying to figure out what questions to ask about what we need to know about how to interact with the surface of the asteroid, but it, it's, it's not a, um, it, this is a defense defense problem, and, and really, I think the DOD should be on top of it. So we've lost Ian, so why don't we, uh, I, think we <laughs> I think this is a sign here. Yeah, uh, we may need to wrap up. From, to wrap it up, but before we do, uh, so thanks Emily, mm -hmm. and, and, thanks to, and thanks to Ian and Alan, who are no longer with us, but, um, but I wanted to uh, let people know that we're going to be doing an interview with climate scientist Michael Mann tomorrow. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. That's right? good. I know. Speaking of coups, so that's going to be tomorrow here on the Google Pluses um, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 a.m. Pacific. 
Oh well, um, yeah. So, so we'll be yeah we'll be interviewing him at seven in the morning Pacific, east ten Eastern, uh, fourteen hundred UTC, and uh, I think that's going to be real interesting. So that's uh, and Nancy's going to be interviewing Michael Mann tomorrow. So and then uh, next week, I don't know if we're if <laughs> how many of us are going to be around. I won't be around because a lot of us will be in Houston for the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. I know that Pamela and I and Nancy are all going to be there, um, and and much more interested in in uh, taking in some science than, than doing a live hangout, although I'll, I'll be looking forward to sharing a lot of the results from that the following week. So um, yeah. I won't be here next week, um, so I don't know what the plans will be for the weekly uh, space. Maybe I'll dig up some fresh blood. So. Yeah. All right. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot, Emily, and we will see some or all of you at any point in the, fu in the future. Bye-bye. See you later.